What's up, Vinyl community? It's your boy Chris coming at you live as always from the man cave. Here on a relaxing Monday afternoon for me. It's the best I've felt. Besides being on vacation with my family last week, it's the best I've felt in a week. So today's been a pretty good day. I've been kicking back, enjoying myself, listening to some tunes, doing some reorganizing here in the man cave, setting things up, getting ready to move some stuff around. Um, and I wanted to take some time to uh, do that Q&A video I told you guys that I was going to do. I feel like I've got enough questions and enough material to make a decent size video. So, uh, might as well get right on into it. There are several of you <laughs> that like to know what kind of beer I'm drinking. Uh, so, for starters, Stone Hop Revolver IPA. Uh, for any of you beer nerds who are watching this, and I'm sure there are a few of you, I can't be the only one in the vinyl community. I know for a fact that... A couple of you guys enjoy craft beer because I've hung out with a couple of you. Shout out David, local biography. But uh, in my opinion, Stone um, probably has the uh, probably has the best grasp of IPAs of, of any big craft brewer. Always good stuff. All right, so getting right into it. Um, first question is from my great friend Melinda Murphy. Melinda, I'm sure you're watching. Uh, and um, she had said that the question was nothing special, uh, Beatles or Stones. All day, every day, Melinda. Uh, absolutely. I love the Stones. I do. Um, I do. Uh, I, I describe about four or five of their albums as essential to me. For the Beatles, all their albums are essential. <laughs> Uh, they're all must-haves. I once had 132 pieces in my Beatles collection and it had 13 albums because I had original U.S. Uh, presses of each album, I had original U.K. presses of each album, I had Japanese presses of each album, and I had a MoFi of each album. And then not to mention every bootleg I ever saw ever in a few 7 inches. It adds up to 132 real fast. But Ended up selling a lot of them off, obviously. Needed the money at the time. No need to go back over that with you guys. You've heard me tell that story before. Um, so there's that for the first question from Melinda Murphy. Next question, Lily Vitari. I'm going to sub this question up because it was a comment and then it was, um, it was um, you know, a question there towards the end. So I'm just pulling out you know, the most important part for the purposes of this video. But Lily had um, you know, commented on how the, you know, I don't talk about a lot of, you know, genres, more popular genres such as rock or, um, you know, classic rock or grunge or something like that because I've made the comment before that those channels, uh, those topics and genres are well represented in the vinyl community and I mean that. They are. Um, and then I wanted to talk about what I was passionate about, damn whether or not it was popular or not. And um, one of the main reasons I never thought I'd reach 500 subscribers is because I spend 95% of my time talking about jazz. So, and I know there's a lot of you guys who watch my channel and subscribe to my channel and comment on every video that don't even care about jazz. So God bless you all. <laughs> it, it can't just be for me. <laughs> there's no way. Hmm. Anyway, so in summary, Lily had asked, how about 10 albums in these other genres that don't get discussed enough elsewhere? Okay, so I ran through my collection real quick and just picked out 10 albums I don't, get, I don't see get talked about. Honestly, it's a quick pick. No doubt I'm going to show you guys a few that you're like, oh, I see that all the time. And I'm sure. But I'm just going by what I don't see. Um, what I don't see. And what I don't see, here's one I don't see. Uh, Leon Russell and the Shutter People. In the Shelter, shelter People. In the Shelter People. Um, Leon Russell, one of the most underappreciated legends and greats in the history of, uh, of uh, popular music, in my opinion. You know, rock, rock and roll country. Great songwriter. Uh, one of the most underappreciated songwriters that ever lived. Uh, he's about as underrated as a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer could possibly be. Honestly. Um, and, you know, Elton John helped to revive his career with that album. Those guys did together. And it's great. Uh, I can't remember the name of it right off top. I had it, but can't remember the name right off top. But I love it. And so, you know, the popular Mr. El Sir Elton John really helped uh, Leon Russell, you know, get revived. Get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because everybody started looking back and going, holy shit, this guy was a genius. And he was. And this album can be found cheap anywhere. I personally got my copy for, I think, five bucks. The sticker's on there, five bucks. Uh, a couple years ago at a record store in Charlotte. So, uh, it's great stuff, and I never see it represented in here. 
Uh, the next one's one of my favorites that I ever found in a record store. Honestly, I mean that sincerely. Uh, I'm getting rid of this damn this plastic flap over. I don't know why I hadn't gotten rid of that before now, but it's gone now. Deuces. Um, Dennis Wilson, Pacific Ocean Blue. I've seen this once or twice, I think, in the vinyl community, but not nearly enough. Um, Dennis Wilson, of course, for, the, for those of you who don't know, member of the Beach Boys. Um, and he was the only Beach Boy that surfed. Everybody likes to equate the Beach Boys with surfing. One of the many reasons the label, uh, Capital, didn't like pet sounds was because there were no surfing songs. Where's the surfing songs? Where's the songs about girls and cheeseburgers and, and you know, Cadillacs and, you know, sh you know Chevys? Where's, where's, where's all those songs at? And so they put that album behind them as fast as they could, quickly threw out a Greatest Hits album. Um, Pet Sounds did not sell well out of the gate, and now it's world-renowned as one of the greatest albums ever released in any genre, ever. I know a lot of people that will tell you it's their favorite album. It's not my favorite album. I love the album. But that's, the, there, there you go. There you have it. But for me, this is the best solo work of any Beach Boy. I remember finding this at Lunchbox Records in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina, and nearly shitting myself, honestly. Uh, and look at that beard. Dennis has just got an epic beard. Look at it. Man. Epic stuff, Dennis. Man. And uh, this album's beautiful. This album is a true work of art. Uh, this is an original pressing. Gatefold. Great stuff. There he is relaxing out by the ocean. You know, the album's not called Pacific Ocean Blue for nothing. Um, it's wonderful. My, my copy sounds immaculate. Uh, got the original insert, which is awesome. Beautiful label. Um, and it's a great copy. It plays strong VG like plus plus. I mean, it is a great, 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 great copy of this album. Um, and I love it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. So this is one of the one of the ones, one of the non-jazz albums, this is one of the biggest ones I found in a record store. I love it. And I'm getting ready to replace that crappy flap sleeve that I just had. Another one I don't see talked about on here. I actually don't see this artist talked about much on here. And again, I'm sure plenty of you see these. I'm sure you do. But I'm just speaking for me. Uh, Tom Waits, Closing Time. And uh, I love early Tom Waits. And uh, Tom Waits is an acquired taste. You either love him or you don't. Um... His voice is gravelly and basically, you know, sounds like he's been chain smoking cigarettes, following in behind with whiskey, um, without any water for his entire life. <laughs> but I don't give a shit. I like it. And my favorite thing about the early Waits albums is, is they're very jazzy, very, uh, very jazzy in, in orientation. And I really, I really, really thoroughly enjoy them. And I have, I actually, you know, went out of my way to acquire a lot of these. And as much of my classic rock, if you will, even though this really doesn't fit into the realm of classic rock for me, that I sold and traded or whatnot for jazz, um, or, you know, sold to pay bills. This one's always stuck around. I've always tried my damnedest to hang on to this one. This is a great album. It's great stuff. I haven't threw it on in a while, but it's great stuff. I highly recommend early Tom Waits for any of you guys who are not familiar with early Tom Waits. And even if you are familiar with Tom Waits and maybe just don't like his voice, you know, stream it real quick for your boy. Give it a shot. I mean, hell, why not? Not gonna hurt you, right? These days it's so easy to just stream music that it won't hurt you. Next up, uh, I don't, I never see the Violent Femmes talked about on here. And I love the Violent Femmes. Um, what I like so much about the Violent Femmes is, is they don't really sound like anybody else. Um, you can't really too much put like one genre on them. I mean, it could be post-punk. Um, it could be, you know, rock. It could be kind of like garage rock, but not really. And some of the stuff is a little funky, kind of, sort of, but not like Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, rock and roll funk. Not like that. But they throw they throw a lot of curveballs at you. And this one and Hollow Ground um, are my two favorites by them. I have both. I just decided to pull this one out because I've always been a big fan of the album cover. I don't know why. I just, you know, I see it. I automatically know what it is. Uh, it's a great album. And if you look at the guys on the back, I mean, they just look like, I'm, pardon me, they just look like three preppy white boys to me. Um, you know, this guy over here is trying to look tough, but uh, 
They just look like three preppy white boys. They look like they'd probably be, you know, three of the most popular guys at the local frat house. Um, <laughs> but it's a great it's a great album, and I love the Violent Fins. I'm sure plenty of you guys are familiar. And again, I'm sure plenty of you guys see plenty of them. Uh, but uh, I don't. Not on YouTube, anyway. Next up, uh, I love Van Morrison. Van Morrison is the king of white soul to me. <laughs> Because uh, really, in essence, you know, people like to group them in with classic rock. There's another one of those albums with that flat. How did I not get rid of this? It's gone now. It's gone. A lot of people like to group it in with classic rock. Um, I don't know why, because it's not. Um, Van Morrison's soul. He just is. He just so happens to be white. And um, you see on the cover, him with a couple of beautiful dogs. Um, I see people talk about Moondance, and Moondance is one of my favorite albums ever. I love Moondance. And I see people talk about Astral Weeks. I've always felt like Astral Weeks was a little overrated, and this one is very underrated. Like I've seen several like major artists. Um, I think um, one that comes to mind is uh, Sinead O'Connor, if I'm not mistaken, says this is her favorite album ever. Any genre, ever. I guess it would make sense. They're both Irish. <laughs> but if you go by Ancestry, so am I on every single side of my family. But anyway, beautiful album, glorious. Uh, for you guys who are familiar with Van Morrison but aren't familiar with this one, like let's just say you've heard Moon Dance and Astral Weeks, look into this one. I highly recommend it, and I never see it in the BC. I don't. I'm sure it's out there, but I never see it. Guys, no doubt some of you are going to be laughing. Somehow, I probably just pulled the only three flat covers I have in my entire collection. I don't know. Go figure. They're all gone. They gone. All right. McDonald and Giles. Um, I think I've seen maybe one or two people show this. Like uh, Dylan. Um, you Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you might have showed this somewhere along the line. Maybe. Uh, but this is another one of my favorites I found at a record store, non-jazz, of course. Um, King Crimson. That's all I got to say to you. King Grimps, McDonald and Goss. Great stuff. Nice cake fold. Um, beautiful prog rock. Um, I really dig it. I'm not exactly 100% sure how you say the name of the label. Cotillion? Cotillion? I, I'm, I'm not positive. Please correct me again. Um, but it's great stuff. And I love the album. And I really just don't see a whole lot of them in the DC. So if you see it, Oh, you guys thought that died with the contest, huh? No. Got to keep it grooving. Next up, uh, Donovan, Sunshine Superman. I'm a big fan of Donovan. I've always been a big fan of Donovan. And this is a great record. And, of course, it's, you know, the one that everybody's going to recognize is Season of the Witch. But my favorite Donovan song was actually not on this. My favorite Donovan song was Hurdy Gurdy Man. But I think most of you guys are very are, are probably familiar with Donovan. It's on, you know, the epic label. Um... It's just really good stuff. It's really good, you know, so much great music came out in the 60s, so much great, you know, rock and, you know, psych rock and, you know, whatnot came out in the 60s that a lot of these guys just kind of, just kind of slipped through. And I think, you know, m most big fans of 60s music know who Donovan is, but casual listeners, probably not. Um, but you've probably at least heard Season of the Witch. Of course, uh, if you, Listen to standard, you know, AM, FM radio. They never, they never tell you who the hell does the songs. Uh, uh. All right, here's one from a very underappreciated singer-songwriter, um, in my opinion, underappreciated. Um, and I never see this in the DC either. But it's uh, Jim Croce. You don't mess around with Jim. And uh, also this one, and you know, there's I got a name. Uh, I got a name. I got a name. It's great stuff I mean, he's an awesome singer songwriter and uh, I never see anybody talk about Jim Croce um, in the in the in the vinyl community I don't I never see it um, for some of those of you who are no doubt Stranger Things fans um, they did um, I can't remember what episode it was and I think it was season two but uh, they did the very first song on this album um, um, you know the, the officer who has uh, custody of uh, of 11 
I can't remember his name now to save my life for those of you who are Stranger Things fans. But he had pulled this album out and threw it onto her and described it to her as real music. And you know, the song that plays is You Don't Mess Around With Jim. So for some of those you know, of you who are not familiar with Jim, to maybe give you some... Anyway, totally didn't plan on talking about that, but why not? Next up, something a little more modern for you guys. I don't like very much modern music, but I love Julian Baker. Julian Baker, sprained ankle. Um, she's like 21 or 22 years old. She's from Nashville. And she's a wonderful singer-songwriter who just sings some of the saddest songs you've probably ever heard in your life. But as a country boy and a sap, basically all of my songs, all of my favorite songs oftentimes are the saddest songs. I don't know why that is, why I can be happy listening to sad music, but I'm often happy listening to sad music and people give me a hard time like how can you love this so much it's so sad and this woman right here pours her whole heart into every song and I highly recommend Julian Baker to anybody with I don't know two ears and a heart if you got two ears and a heart Julian Baker's for you my copy is on yellow wax um, another one of the ones again I never wanted to get rid of this album and she's got a follow up album to this one as well but I prefer this one um, I prefer this one. I'll tell you what, if any of you guys, I haven't used this code. Hopefully I get in there far enough. If I don't, message me. I'll send it to you anyway. But it can be used one time, obviously. I don't think it's expired. Um, here, screenshot that. If you're not familiar with Julian Baker, screenshot that. You're welcome because you need to listen to her. You're welcome from your boy. Again, if you didn't get that, message me. Let me know. But if you're not familiar with Julian Baker, you need to hear her. So it had an album code in there, and I don't listen to the album to music really any other way. So uh, you're welcome. Next up, uh, this was one that uh, that uh, my boy Dylan had put me on to shh, maybe 10 years ago, at least. Uh, Stephen Stills is Manassas. Um, just think like if you know Stephen Stills' version of uh, Exile on Main Street. But, you know, Stephen Steeles and Chris Hillman and Dallas Taylor and Paul Harris and Fuzzy Samuels and Al Perkins and Joe Leela. Um, it's a great record. It's a two LP. It's a double LP, which is probably why I just came up with the XL on Main Street uh, comparison. But uh, it's great stuff. It's really great stuff. So, Lily, I believe that's 10. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure that's 10. Um, next up, my boy Chris has the spins. Contest winner. Time to jump on it. Cheers, my friend. Hope you're doing okay up there in Green Bay. Looks like you had a lot of fun over the 4th. Um, following along on Instagram. Great stuff, buddy. Um, hidden gems in the world of jazz guitar. Uh, he had mentioned that, you know, he's familiar with Wes Montgomery and Grant Green. And, uh, you know, Kenny Burrell and some of these other guys. He had mentioned that. Um. And, you know, one or two of these albums might feature those guys on it. But still, just because you're familiar with the guys doesn't mean you're familiar with the albums. Chris, I wanted to, I wanted to tell you that I will do a, an entire video on that coming up soon. When I really go through my collection and really dig out some good jazz guitarists for you that you don't know. I'm going to do that. But for the time being, and, the, and, the, and the, you know, for the purposes of doing this Q&A video, I just pulled out a few for you real quick. Um, this is Gitz Gilberto. Um, as you guys know, Mr. Gilberto just passed. Um, very sad. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard this one, Chris. If you haven't, it's definitely the kind of thing you'd like. Absolutely the kind of thing you'd like. But, um, classic album. Uh, hadn't listened to it in a long time. It's classic. Um, another one that she'll definitely like. Uh, the next two are by the same artist. And, uh, they're, you know... Within the last year, acquisitions for me. There's um, Jitsi 66 by, by Gabor Zabo. Um, it's on Impulse. You know, beautiful Impulse Gatefold, Impulse Spine. It's great stuff, and he does a lot of covers of uh, rock and roll songs and whatnot, like he does Yesterday on here. He does Yesterday on here, which is awesome. Um, the Echo of Love. Um, yeah, he does, you know, he, he does If I Fail. If I fell in love with you, would you pop? Yeah, Beatles, you guys know. Um, great stuff. Um, and Chris, I think you'd really dig it. Um, 
you didn't mention him as a guy you were familiar with. So, uh, hey, if I threw you one, I hope so. And uh, this is not one that's really that expensive either, buddy. Um, and of course, I mean, why not show you the beautiful Impulse Mono Label? Um, another one by him. I think you might like this one even better because I know you like uh, Latin music and whatnot. And this is a, a little more, you know, Latin feel to it. It's Jazz Raga. Same artist. Um, great stuff. Impulse Label. Um, this one's got a little bit more, yeah, uh, of that kind of feel to it. So I definitely think you'd like it. Uh, maybe look that one up. Uh, next one, you didn't mention this one. A lot of people don't mention this one for uh, for jazz guitar, but it's a classic, and it's not an original pressing. You guys wouldn't be shocked, right? Um, but it's uh, Intermodulation, Bill Evans, Jim Hall, and it's a Japanese pressing, and it sounds immaculate. And it will probably belong to one of you guys some days when I get my original. But uh, in the meantime, I'm very happy with this original Verve Jazz Classics uh, copy of uh, Intermodulation by the great Bill Evans and Jim Hall. And of course, uh, Chris, um, Bill Evans is the pianist. Jim Hall is the guitarist. You'd love this one, buddy. It's really smooth, really laid back. Um, great picking on this record. You would really dig it. Next one up. I know you mentioned that you were familiar with Kenny Burrell. I know you did. But I, I pulled one out anyway, um, because A, this one's hard to find, B, it'd be fun to show off, and C, even though you're familiar with Kenny Burrell, I bet you're not familiar with this album. Uh, but this is two guitars on Prestige. It's Kenny Burrell and Jim Rainey, and they are the two guitars. And of course, it's also got Donald Byrd, McLean, Donald Byrd, Jackie McLean, Mal Waldron, Doug Watkins, and Arthur Taylor on the drums. This is a killer, killer record. Not easy to find. You don't see it every day at all. You can ask pretty much any other jazz collector on here. They'll tell you the same thing I just told you. Is uh, Yeah, you might be familiar with Kenny Burrell, but uh, beautiful prestige label. 446 West 50th Street, New York City labels. Great, great record. I know you said you were familiar with Kenny Burrell, but uh, again, Look that one up. That one's great, especially for a guitar fan, a guitar enthusiast like yourself. Next up, <laughs> Lucille Childs, uh, my good friend Lucille. Che cheers to you, Lucille. I hope you had a happy fourth. Hello, Chris. Who is your most hated group and song and why? <laughs> okay, so I've hated plenty of groups and plenty of songs in my life. Plenty. I hate damn near everything that's being made now. Damn near. Uh, so to come up with a most hated group and a most hated song is going to be tough. But I'll tell you what, I'll just pull out somebody I really can't stand their music. Um, Florida Georgia Line. I can't stand Florida Georgia Line. That is not country music. You can show up to the ACMs and the CMAs all you want. You can dress as country as you want. You can speak in a southern accent as much as you want. But uh, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. And... Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you these guys are terrible. And um, that damn song that was on every radio station, that um, you know, it was on country radio, pop radio, top 40 radio, everything, and it's terrible. It's not country. Play a song, you make me want to roll my windows down. I know what you guys are all thinking is, Chris, how do you know that? Well, it was everywhere. You couldn't escape it. But that's not my most hated song. I can think of plenty more songs I hate more than that one. Basically, if these guys would call themselves what they actually are, they probably wouldn't bother me that bad. But they try to say they're country music, and that's what pisses me off. Because for a guy like me who grew up listening to Cash and Waylon and George Jones and Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn and Dolly Parton, for a guy like me who grew up listening to that and for, them, for those fuckers to call themselves country pisses me off to my core, as you guys can tell. Uh, they are not. <laughs> wow. Okay, anyway. Um... Songs I hate. Okay. The Macarena. God, I hate the Macarena. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it even more so that they got so filthy rich off that bullshit because it's nothing. It's the same words over and over and over and over again, and they came up with a dance white people can do. I'm just going to come on out with it. That is why it was so successful. They came up with a dance that your 75-year-old white grandmother could do at a wedding. That's it. That's why. And they made millions. And, you know, all the guys, you know, as long as they invested the money, they're all probably filthy rich. If not, they probably work at Taco Bell because I can't imagine they ever did anything worthwhile after that. But um, 
I hate that. And uh, Gangnam Style. God, I hate Gangnam Style. That is the dumbest dance I've ever seen in my life, and it's just terrible. And I hate Macarena more, but I hate that. I hate any song that it feels like my two-year-old daughter could write, and people made millions, it pisses me off. But anyway, not that I'm passionate about it or anything. <laughs> it's just I have a lot of friends, guys, that are musicians. A lot of friends that are musicians, and I have a lot of friends that are talented musicians, and I have a lot of family members that are talented musicians and really try and really grit and grind and really play the clubs and play the bars and really give it their all just to make enough money to, you know, to upgrade their equipment. You know, they're not paying the bills with it. These guys all have full-time jobs, and they are so much better than any of these fucking people. <laughs> and they're so much more passionate about it except for chips didn't fall their way and so that's what it is and I don't know whether or not any of them are bitter about it if they are they haven't told me but uh, again I know dozens of people more talented than some of these guys I just mentioned dozens um, okay this next one um, kind of off the top um, Danny Elliott uh, did you move from rock and hip hop to modern jazz and if so why what appeals to you about this type of music okay um, I can't say I've ever moved away from any genre of music I've ever loved in my life. Um, I grew up listening to a lot of uh, classic rock, uh, hip-hop, and country. As a teenager, I listened to a ton of hip-hop because that's when hip-hop was really good. Um, the hip-hop that was popular when I was a teenager, I still like. Uh, I will still tell you to this day that one of my 10 to 15 favorite albums is probably the Notorious B.I.G.'s Ready to Die. That's an album that came out in 1994 when I was nine years old. Uh, I adore it as much today as I ever did. Uh, so I never moved away from hip-hop so much as I just, I, I love the hip-hop that was popular when I was a kid and teenager. I don't really like the mumble rap that comes out now. I don't. I like Kendrick Lamar. I like J. Cole. That's about it. I like Run the Jewels. That's about it. Um, so I haven't moved away from it. I still love the stuff that I grew up loving. And country, obviously, I still listen to the country that I grew up loving. And then I like Chris Stapleton and Jamie Johnson and Sturgill Simpson and Margot Price um, and Miranda Lambert. I mean, I, I, you know, I like people like that still. To this day, I'll listen to anything they put out. Um, rock, there's not a day in my life that goes by I don't listen to some rock and roll. It's just not. Um, even if I listen to ten albums, okay, nine of them might be jazz, but there's going to be a rock album in there somewhere. So I never moved away from rock and roll. Um, I don't know if I would call the jazz that I adore to be modern jazz. I mean, I don't know how modern 50 and 60 year old records can be. Um, I like some of the guys that, you know, are on the scene these days, you know, guys like Kamasi Washington, you know, I, I like, I like some of these guys, but, uh, they can't compete, you know, with my, with my, with my heroes. Uh, what attracts me to this kind of music is it's the best musicians in the history of the planet all working their asses off and practicing and mastering their crafts to create genius, to make the best music, in my opinion, the world has ever seen. Um, it's all American art form, um, at least at its foundation anyway. And um, these guys were masters. These guys practiced all day, every day to create something great. And these guys didn't become filthy rich. These guys didn't play stadiums. These guys played nightclubs. And these guys, most of them died broke. Most of them died broke and hooked on drugs. And because it was a hard life being a jazz musician, you know, you play a nightclub, then you get in the car and you drive to another nightclub. And, you know, you're up all night. And most of these guys died young and poor. Most of them. And they're my damn heroes. I mean, there aren't, there aren't too many Sonny Rollins redemption stories out there where, you know, Sonny Rollins is still among us, even though he was hooked on drugs way back in the, 50s and 60s, um, he made it out. He's still among us. It's still in relatively good health from everything I, from everything I understand. There's not too many stories like that. Um, he's the exception, not the rule. Um, but more so than everything, it's just the dedication and the time and the mastery of your craft. Um, this is going to be controversial. I know a lot of guys, I've known a lot of guys who put down rock and roll drums and put down rock and roll guitar for years and didn't touch it. And then you get them together in a room and all of a sudden you have them jam and they pick it up and it's like they, it's like they never lost anything. They might tell you they lost anything, but your ears tell you they haven't lost anything. 
let a jazz trumpeter or saxophonist or whatnot put that shit down for all those years, see if they can pick that up and still master it the same way. I don't see that. That is a lifestyle. That is your life. And these guys mastered it, and they're the best. Um, so not really a short answer, Danny, but uh, that's my answer. And uh, to me, it's the greatest music that was ever made. All right. The last question that I've got um, it wasn't even put under the um, the uh, contest announcement slash QA inquiry that I had posted on my um, on my uh, profile um, a few weeks ago, but it was on another one, and I just you know figured I'd take some time to address it because it's not a bad question. It's not a bad question. Um, I just maybe disagree with a couple of the points, but it's not a bad question. Uh, Ron Beaudry, I think I'm pronouncing your name right, buddy. I hope so. If not, please correct me. But uh, it was a big, long comment. He and I actually had a, you know, like a four-comment thread going. But uh, he eventually made it to this point. I was just wondering why you don't want to purchase Music Matters or the Blue Note 45 RPM re reissues. Originals are great, but the new reissues are probably just as good, if not better, and a lot cheaper. Okay, there's a couple of disagreements I have in there. There's a couple. Have you looked at the prices of the Music Matters in the Blue uh, Note uh, 45 RPMs lately? Do me a favor, eBay it. Get on eBay, put in Music Matters vinyl, or put in Blue Note 45 vinyl. These things are going for $150, $200 now, man. So they're really not a cheaper alternative if you want to reissue. They're not at all. Now, I'll give, you, give me a second, and I'll give you some. Uh, when they first come out, you know, they come out in limited qualities. They don't come out, you know, they don't, they don't press millions of these things. They press a couple thousand. I guess if you can be on top of it, as soon as they're released, okay, maybe they're not. But like um, at this very moment, uh, moment um, uh, Blue Note, you know, Tone, po uh, Tone Poet series, those are coming out right now. Those are like thirty bucks. I'd buy one of those way before I bought a Music Matters or Blue Note Forty Five series. Because if you're going to buy a reissue, why go broke buying a reissue? Um, if you want to spend some cash, get yourself an original. That's just my opinion on that. I've never spent a hundred dollars on a reissue. Um, that ain't happening. Um, but um, I have had, and I do still have them. I do still have Blue Note 45. Matter of fact, I pulled one out just to show you. The Blue Note 45 RPM series of uh, Kenny Dorham's Whistle Stop. It's great, nice glossy cover, two LPs, 45 RPM. As soon as I can get myself an original, this will be sold to somebody and I'm gonna get over $100 for it, guaranteed, because that's what they go for, market value. So you let me find an original of this for two hundred, and I turn around and sell this for a buck twenty-five. Then that original all of a sudden was only seventy-five bucks out of my pocket. These are more so placeholders and investments for me, um, but they're great. Uh, the next one I'm going to show you is Hank Mobley with Donald Byrd and Lee Morgan. What a blow! What a blowing session this was. And this is a Japanese pressing. It's a Japanese King pressing from nineteen eighty-three. And it's great. And I'm here to tell you, just as good as any Music Matters reissue I've ever heard, and a lot cheaper. I think this record cost me 30 or 40 bucks. Whereas the Dorum that I just showed you, that Blue Note 45, is going for over 100. I got mine of the steel. I got mine for 50. But I got lucky. I was the only bidder on an auction, somehow, some way. I think it's because the guy, you know, had a low seller history and I took a chance. But, um, I'd rather have this. You can get it. You can get it a lot cheaper, and it sounds just as good. Um, next up, uh, classic records pressing Hank Mobley. In the Blue Note fifteen sixty eight. Obviously, this is one where the original goes for a lot. Like I will have a hard time ever really getting myself an original of this because it just goes for so much money. I'd really, 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 really have to get lucky. But I did get an original, um, mono. Uh, saxophone Colossus once in a, in a straight up even trade so uh, I won't rule anything out after that uh, to me anything's possible now thanks Dylan um, but yeah classic records great great reissue uh, they also have gone up and spiked in value these things you can find them going for over a hundred bucks now um, they're great um, but over a hundred bucks really for a reissue Lee Morgan with Hank Mobley, Kenny Rogers, Horace Silver, Paul Chambers, Charlie Person, Blue Note 1541. Great stuff. 
uh, this is Classic Records. Fun story, I actually sold a Liberty pressing of this to upgrade to this one because I like the sound of this one better. But that being said, the Liberty pressings of this one are substantially cheaper. And if I can't have the original, I want the best sounding pressing I can get. And I know I can flip this one for good money when I find my original because they're going for good money. But to me, I really, man, I can't really see where music matters. Um, and uh, and uh, the Blue Note 45s are really, you know, cheaper alternatives. I just, I mean, are they a little cheaper? Sure, but ugh, I'd rather spend a little bit extra and get my originals. Um, if you want cheaper, you know, you get the Liberty Pressings from Blue Note. Cheaper and really high quality. The Japanese King Pressings that I just showed you a minute ago with my Mobley cheaper and just as good as any Music Matters reissue I've ever heard. Easy. Um, easy. Uh, the Blue Note Tone Poet series is coming out right now. Those things are like 30 to $35. Now, they're not going to put out every Blue Note album, you know, ever, but, you know, like Lee, Lee Morgan's Cornbread was just pressed. I'm hearing great things about that. Um, I think they just pressed uh, Dexter Gordon's Clubhouse. That's an album I don't have original, so I'm thinking about getting one myself. It's going to be about 30 bucks. I mean... If I'm going to buy a reissue, I'm going to go somewhere like that. Um, the Blue Note 80th uh, anniversary uh, presses right now. Those are coming out. I've got one or two. They sound great. Now, I will jump over top of a bridge to sell them to one of you guys in the event that I can get my hands on an original. But they really do sound great, and they're $20 to $25. You can't beat it. Uh, I'm not going to break the bank for a reissue for the most part is what I'm telling you. Um, and I don't think they sound just as good. I don't. I had the best reissue I ever heard in my life was a Disc Union 200 gram mono Japanese pressing of Hank Mobley's Roll Call. Um, about six months ago, I got an opportunity to upgrade to a first mono press. I jumped on it, jumped on it, jumped on it. Got it? And before I sold my other one, because I already had a buyer lined up, but I'm like, before I put this in the box and ship it, let me compare them side by side. I did. The original mono sounds better. That was the closest I'd ever heard a reissue come to the original mono. Granted, I'll say that. Those are good investments. They're expensive, though. They're over 100 bucks if you want one. Closest I've ever heard it come. I'll give you that. But I turned around and flipped that. Disc Union Japanese press for a hundred bucks. The original mono I was getting was one seventy five, seventy five dollars out of my pocket. I got myself an original. You can't beat it. Um, original jazz pressings, if you really want them, don't have to break your pockets if you're smart about it. If you know how to flip, if you know some people who can hook you up, if you know some people that'll make some deals with you. If you know some people that'll let you pay in installments, if you know some people that will accept trades, if you know some people, you know, who will gladly buy your reissues off of you, your high dollar reissues, you turn around, flip it, bam, get your original, and you don't have to go broke. Um, so it's a great question, Ron. It really is. It's a great question. And uh, by the way, um, I don't know if you ever saw my intro to jazz uh, video on here. I know you hadn't seen many of my videos when you left a comment. But I'm actually a big advocate for Music Matters uh, reissues, as well as uh, original jazz classics if you're into prestige. Or, um, or, you know, hell, these days, the Tone Poets and the Blue Note 80s. I'm a big advocate for those. I understand that the original jazz, light, uh, jazz pressings aren't for everybody, and they're not, you know, for everybody's budget. And I understand. I do. I would definitely advocate for anybody to buy any of those. And I still have a few. I have a few Music Matters. I have a few Blue Note 45s. I just grabbed a few examples. If I would have grabbed a bunch of examples, this video would have really gotten out of control and I'm already, I'm already coming up on 40 minutes. So, um, Anyway, I guess I really had a lot to say to you guys for only one, two, three, four, five, six questions, I think. Yeah, six questions. Uh, oh, well. Six questions, 40-minute video. Seems legit, right? Uh, <laughs> you guys can't say you didn't get thorough answers. Anyway, um, Going to be a couple more videos coming up for you guys in the next day and a half or so. I got a couple days off. I had today off. I actually intended to do more videos today. It just didn't happen. I got today off. I got all day tomorrow off. 
Um, so I'm sure you'll get a couple more videos uh, out of me before I go back to work on Wednesday. Um, until next time, until next video, keep dropping that evening, you guys. Shake, 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 shake.